a little bit fun because every time that I think that God is done, it's almost like he's just beginning. <laughs> I don't know if that's true for you, but kind of like taking it to the streets, we've been learning some interesting things as we've gone from inside to outside. You know, the weather, that kind of is different. The sunshine is different. The rain, the wind, you know, all those kinds of things that happen on the outside. Or people walking by, or people smiling and waving, or people talking and sharing. You know, being there where people are. Because after all, you and I, aren't we people too? And that's kind of what I like about taking it to the street. I like being out and about. I like be kind of like having fun and sharing and talking and relating. Isn't that what you like to do? Don't you like to communicate? Don't you like to share? Don't you like to talk? I know lots of times when I want to strike up a conversation, that's what I do. I strike up a conversation. I talk. I relate. Give out information. Kind of like what you do. You know, talk, rap, jab. You know, kind of the things that most people do. Some people have a cup of tea, a spot of tea, as they might say, or as my wife's uh, brother-in-law would say, he would have tea and crumpets, or he would talk about his job or his interest because he was English. Oh, he's an American, but he was English, so he would have those crumpets and tea. But you see, those are things that he liked to talk about. What I like to talk about is a little different. You see, I like to talk about Jesus, and so... I don't find too many people talking about Jesus nowadays. Most people want to preach, or they want to teach, or they want to promote, or they want to invoke, or they want to argue, or they want to debate. I don't want to do any of those things. I just want to relate. As a matter of fact, kind of like what the things I do is more like talking about what God has talked to me about. You see, I'm able to share those things that I know from what God has told me to do. Now, I don't know what he tells you to do. I mean, that's between you and God. You see, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. That's your choice. You can do whatever you want to do. You can relate information. You can talk a good story. You can walk a good life. You can do whatever things that you, know, you and God have determined for yourself to do. But you see, in my life, I've had kind of a different kind of lifestyle. My Family, you know, used to be kind of like, we moved around a lot, you know, so my mother was, you know, the old story was, you know, I was born under one brimstone, you know, paint your wagon kind of thing. Well, that's kind of like what my family life was like, you know, paint your wagon, okay, grab a song, boys, come along, paint your wagon, come along. You know, we were singers, you know, and we were dancers, and we enjoyed kind of like singing and dancing and you know, we weren't saved at the time. My mother never raised us in any kind of religion. But you could say we were kind of gypsy-like. And the funny thing was, was that later when I got saved, that was one of the expressions that somebody coined for me. Her name was Starla. And she was more of a gypsy than I am. But she coined the phrase Jesus Gypsy about me because of the fact that when the wind blew, Michael knew that it was time to go. You know, the scripture that says, Whithersoever the wind bloweth, you need to know where it's coming from, the where it's going, so she's everyone led by the Spirit of God. Well, I've worked a lot of jobs, and I've kind of like been a lot of places, and kind of done a lot of things, and well, you know, yeah, it fits. <laughs> so starting this new series, again, another series, you know, the Jesus Gypsy series, we're kind of relating some information that may be about Jesus, but maybe more from a gypsy point of view. Kind of like taking it to the streets like a gypsy might do. Because you see, I'm sitting in a chair. Yeah, really. See, that's a camp chair. I'm camping out. You could say I'm having a camp revival, but we ain't going to go there. Because <laughs> that's kind of weird. But you know, I am kind of like a gypsy because guess what? I'm recording from that table. And I'm doing it on a laptop. Because when we decided to take it to the streets, we decided that we wanted to take it to the streets. <laughs> After all, I kind of grew up on the streets. I kind of experienced life from the other side of the tracks. 
well, I wasn't like, you know, a criminal element. I wasn't like a, you know, hippie kind of child thing. You know, I was more intellectual than that. But I was impoverished at times. I was poor and needy. I was desperate and crying out. I was someone who wanted love and to be loved. And you know, I didn't find it on the streets. Matter of fact, I saw a lot of things on the streets that I'd say, hey, you know what? That ain't what's happening. And every time that I saw what I didn't want to do, sure enough, you know, I'd figure out that, you know what? Once I watched it long enough, I realized, no, I don't think I want to go that way. I think I want to go the other way. And then when I tried the other way, I figured out, I don't want to be there either. I want to go the other way. So I kept trying things out to see which way I wanted to go. And I kind of figured it out along the way. Because people would give me bits of advice. You know, when you're on the streets, you can get a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit all around the town. And eventually, you might be found by God. God might reach down and speak to you. God might reach out and grab hold of you. God might, in some way, talk to you in a personal and intimate way. And that's kind of what the whole idea behind Video has always been. God is real. And that's what I found out. You see, I didn't have to put my faith in anything. God made himself real to me. Oops! God demonstrated himself to me. Oops! God proved himself to me. Oops! I had no excuse. Matter of fact, I had plenty of excuses not to follow God, except for one. When he spoke to me, uh-oh, put it bluntly, I was screwed. <laughs> I had no excuse. So, when I went out looking for love, I found it. You know, when I got saved, I was still kind of like, wow, this is awesome. But, you know, I was still kind of like a little lonely, you know. So it kind of like it took me a while to kind of get the shtick here, you know, because I was always trying to find my satisfaction in the realization of going to church or finding, you know, fellowship with people. And I found out they don't always, you know, live up to what Jesus said, you know. They weren't doing all the things that Jesus said to do. But they were trying to get by too, just like me. They were trying to do the best that they could. And in some places, I found it more so. And in some places, I found it less so. Matter of fact, I found it always so that everyone wanted to know Jesus more. So I thought, cool, that's what I'm about. And that's what I've been about all my life. I've never been satisfied with just knowing about God. I wanted to know God. I wasn't satisfied with just kind of learning about faith. I wanted to know and be real with God. I wanted God to be real. Otherwise, I didn't want to follow some idealism. I didn't want to follow some ideology. I didn't want a philosophy. I didn't want some religious trappings or mappings or some kind of box set, you know, where I could buy, you know, for a certain amount of money, I could buy Jesus, you know, on 1595 and get all of his life laid out before me. I didn't have that kind of money. Matter of fact, most of the time, I couldn't do what most Christians do because I was poor. Wow. I was itinerant. Well, okay, maybe I've never been itinerant. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was born with an IQ. Eh, and I never knew what to do with it. So guess what? My IQ is there, but, you know, what I've done with it, yeah, God has taken care of. But the point being is that I was intelligent enough to say, hey, no, yes, okay, let's go, you know, and once God revealed himself, I had to go, oh, and stop everything I was doing and deal with the living God. You see, once you have an experience with God, once you know that you know, nothing else matters, really. You can't take away somebody's faith from them. Oh, you could probably distract them for a while, and that's what's happening in the world a lot. Or you could kind of like attract them to something else that's going to kind of get them tied up and bound up, all caught up in themselves that they're so busy doing their own thing that they have no time for the God thing, you know, or to pay attention to what Jesus said. Because, you know, that's the idea behind distractions and attractions is they're supposed to get you focused in on them and not him. Real easy way to look at it. It's about him, not you, not me, not thee, not thou, not thine. That's why we used to say one way, one God, one Jesus. Focus on him. And that's kind of why Jesus Gypsy is all about him. It's all about Jesus. Because Jesus said, 
and that's where we leave it at. Matter of fact, I kind of like that. I like it being about Jesus because when Jesus speaks, it makes sense. Every time I hear somebody tell me or try to interpret Jesus, it don't make no sense to me at all. Matter of fact, every time I listen to someone interpret, as soon as they start to interpret Jesus, I start going, oh boy. And I listen. But you see, I'm not stupid. That's part of the problem. I'm not dumb. That's another part of the problem. Matter of fact, I kind of follow the sun, so you know what? Because I do, I kind of get myself in trouble because I remind people what Jesus said. And every time I remind them, they don't want to know. They'd rather tell me what Paul said or what Peter said or some other thing, you know, but they never want to talk about what Jesus said. So that's what makes me the Jesus Gypsy I am today. Because, you know, when it comes down to arguing with somebody who's already saved, or debating with somebody who's very religious, or discussions with all those people that have some kind of religion, I just ask them, well, fine. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we could ask the source. Maybe we could talk to the person who started it. Maybe this controversial subject could be resolved if we would just ask. If we would just seek, we would just find who is this person that's causing all this problem in the world or has the solution to the problems of the world. This Jesus. And like a gypsy, unfortunately, when people say, I talk to Jesus, they think I'm crazy. Well, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I took him literal. And he talked to me. <laughs> well, and I'm crazy. No, that's what some people think. They think I'm nuts because I have no problem telling you, yes, I hear God speak. No problem. He can talk to me. He can talk to you. I have no problem saying, no, it's not always in the written word of God. Sure, if you want to prove it, you can go back to whatever God speaks to you about you know, and then say, hey, here it is in the word. Well, unfortunately... Every time God spoke to me, I don't have any problem about it being from the Word. It's pretty easy to know. God really doesn't contradict himself. So if God's speaking to you, you don't have a problem. You don't have to keep going, well, you know, I'm hearing voices in my head, so I think I'm crazy and I better be dead because guess what? You know what? I'm kind of going nuts over this. No, that's not the way Jesus operates in my life. So maybe he doesn't hear us. Maybe you better go out and prove things. You don't have to kind of like look at the Word and do this, that, and the other thing in order to figure out where you're about. Because what you're hearing, you don't know whether it's not God or not. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had that problem yet. If I run into it, I'll let you know what I told. But fortunately, the Spirit of God who dwells within me, He has caused me to have ears to hear what Jesus says. Unfortunately, the Spirit of God who dwells within me has given me eyes to see at times even Jesus. You see, the Spirit of God who dwells within me has caused me to trust in the Lord with all my heart, meaning not my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledging Him and letting Him direct my path. Because you see, the Spirit of God, when we were told that the Comforter would come, He would not speak of Himself according to what Jesus said, but He would speak of me according to what He told me. Well, I like that, because you see, I could probably speak to myself and talk myself into a lot of things, and sometimes I do. I could probably make up for myself and create for myself some kind of way I want to go, and sometimes I do. Matter of fact, I could probably come up with all kinds of religious ideas. And come up with all kinds of interpretations, dogmas, doctrines, hermeneutics, homiletics, and all the other things, the trash, you know, and the dissertations and the explanations and all the kind of frustrations and aggravations that all kinds of people come up with. Because that's kind of what people do. You know, they like to create all these things in our own imaginations. Because we like to imagine things. You know, imagine there's no heaven. Give it a try, whatever. Imagine there's no God. Imagine this, that, and the other thing. And that's what a lot of people do. They imagine. But I didn't get that option, unfortunately. 
I got direct confrontation. I got direct intervention. Matter of fact, that's kind of what being a Christian is all about. It's having a direct relationship with God. And that's kind of what the problem is, too, because you see, once you have a personal relationship with God, it's, um, dare I say, personal. And so for me, because it is a personal relationship with God, because I'm a Jesus gypsy, I might show up someday with my little camp chair and my little camp table, and I might sit down and read a word or two and enjoy what it is that God may say, because it is the Lord our God who is speaking, isn't it? After all, He is the one who listen to. Walk in love. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Love covereth all sins. Yo! Don't push on the gate. Thank you. So, because love covers all things, love endures all things, love bears all things, love also, in this case, warns people of all things. Especially when a gate is closing on someone. You don't want someone to get caught in a gate. You don't want someone to get stuck in a gate. You don't want someone to get hurt by the gate. As a matter of fact, you want the person to be careful. You want the person to be safe. You want the person not to get caught up in getting stuck in the gate. Because, after all, once the gate starts to close, it can hurt someone, especially children. So when someone is getting caught in a gate, you want to warn them about what could happen if they stay in front of the gate, especially in electric gate. So you might cry out a warning. You might give a warning. And that's kind of what Jesus does when he talks about love. He says in love to walk in it to talk in it, to live it out, even in your day-to-day -day existence. Love will, at times, present itself in such a way that you have to say the truth in love. Don't get stuck in the gate. It's closing. Just like the gospel, just like today as the day of salvation, just like Jesus saying, hey, I know you have heard it said to hate your enemies and to, you know, love those of your friends, but I say unto you, love your enemies. And love those who miserably persecute you. Because love is what he has called us to be. Love is what he has called us to do. So in preparing ourselves for that love to the world, we ought to love one another, as he has said. Because love covereth all sins. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any that your brother, if you have ought against any, when you, boy, Let's try that one again. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So you should forgive, because if you don't forgive, you might not be forgiven. But if you remember while you're praying to, you remember while you're praying that someone has ought against you, then forgive them and then go and reconcile yourself to your brother, because that's what the Holy Spirit is doing while you're praying. He's answering a prayer. Not the way you think, but guess what? He's there. And so do forgive, so that you would love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. Rejoice not when thy enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you yourselves therefore are called that you should inherit a blessing. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Be you kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. My little children, love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Because you see, in everything and in all ways, in some ways, you're going to find yourself confronted. You're going to find yourself in all ways, in some ways, every day, confronted. You're always going to find in some possibility and some reality the fact that things aren't always going to go the way you think they go. Matter of fact, that's kind of what determines what kind of person you are because 
when you run into things going not the way you thought they would, how do you react to circumstances? How do you react to situations? How do you deal with frustrations? As a matter of fact, how do you be about what God is all about when it comes to things that aren't about you? As a matter of fact, I think you're going to find it's all about Him and what He's doing with you, in you, and about you. Because God is at work both to do and to will of His good pleasure. And if He can't use you as you are, he'll make you into what he wants you to be. But I would rather be walking with, talking to, and alive unto God, and listening to his voice, and doing his will, than to be maybe a planter over here that looks like nice flowers, until they're pulled up and transplanted for the winter flowers, and then pulled up and transplanted for the spring flower. In other words, would you rather be a blessing or a curse? The determination of which you are is based upon of how you are. And what God wants you to be is love one another as he has loved you, as I love you, as whether you know it or not, if you are not saved, it doesn't change how I want to be. It doesn't change how I ought to be. It doesn't change what I am. As a matter of fact, it lets you know you have a friend. You have someone here who's praying for you. You have someone here who's willing to stay with you. Someone here who's willing to save you. I love you, even if you think you are my enemy.